Welcome to Voices, a library lecture series. We'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that we are gathered on the sacred homelands of the Mahikiniak or Mohican people who are the stewards of this land. Today, the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present. Voices presents speakers on timely and enduring issues each semester to broaden and enrich the scope of studies at Hudson Valley Community College. Please fill out a survey at the link on our first slide. These help to inform our future programming. Today, Voices presents Jamela Anderson. Jamela is the founder of Free Food Fridge Albany. She is a well-known activist in the Capital Region. In addition, in addition to founding the Free Food Fridge, Jamela is a yoga instructor and birth worker. Please welcome Jamela Anderson. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you to Hudson Valley for having things like this to amplify voices of people who look like me. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. And um, I wanna go off, um, just start basically talking about where, where I grew up, how I grew up, and then moving into how the fridge kind of came to be about and like the whole fridge program. So uh, as Anne said before, uh, I am a birth worker and I am a yoga teacher. And those two things are what I've been doing by trade alongside many other things like working in restaurants and uh, working in a nonprofit. And so it's taken a long time for me to maybe even admit that working in a nonprofit has helped you know, inform the work that I'm doing now. And so I'm really grateful for that job, although I didn't stay for very long. Uh, so yeah. Uh, I am from, I grew up in Clifton Park, which is just a little bit north of where we are. And it was a really difficult upbringing, difficult childhood, being one of the only few black people who lived there. I didn't have many friends who looked like me. And although I was very personable and I was able to um, get along with everybody, it was definitely very isolating. And it took me many years into my adulthood to be able to even understand the velocity in which, like, that I had felt so alone. Um, and so I will say in this work that I've been doing that it has been very healing to, um, to honor what I didn't have before to be able to help pave and, and pave the way for young people who look like me and who do feel isolated and who do feel alone to be able to say, hey, like we are here and we are listening. So just wanna say that and you know, pat my younger self on the back and say it's gonna be okay. Um, so I started teaching yoga in 20, 2013 and 2014, and one of the main things that I wanted to do within teaching yoga was to help people feel more comfortable being themselves. And for me, that's what yoga did, and that's what I wanted to provide for other people. And so I did it for a few years, and I started to kind of see the holes in, in yoga and things that I felt that weren't being addressed or um, weren't being uh, accounted for. And feeling again, this sense of isolation and knowing that I'm not alone, but knowing that there are no other people around to again, look like me or who I can talk to about that. So something that I've been doing and I think where a lot of my activism started was with yoga. And for me, it was, you know, finding people who look like me, going to places and studios and finding a community outside of the one that I already had. And I say like that's kind of where the seed was sort of planted, but at this point I worked a lot. I worked at a coffee shop for most of my like 20s and that's all I knew. So I was just working, but I still sort of like wanted to to perform in, um, not, not, not even perform, but rather participate in, in the decolonizing of, of the yoga world and not having necessarily language or skills or education in doing that. So. I'm really, that's like where it really all started to kind of churn for me. And then fast forward uh, a few years and I started getting into birth work. And birth work was like, that for me was something that really allowed me to help um, unlearn and relearn what it meant to be supportive and to, to be supportive to people again who look like me and to help them move into a new phase of their lives. So I'm starting to see where a lot of the intersections are coming in uh, with birth work and with yoga. And again, this is sort of like my, you know, my activism. So 
I started to get more vocal. And uh, the more vocal I got, <laughs> the more uncomfortable people around me got. And I'm really grateful because if it wasn't for people feeling uncomfortable, there wouldn't be so much change that has happened so rapidly. And for me, looking to people who I count as family, whether they're blood or not, and, and taking cues from them and the activism that they've been doing. So I wanna also acknowledge that I am doing this work because of the people who have come before me along with my ancestors and along with just other community members who may not be up here, but I'm not speaking for them, but I wanna amplify their voices and amplify their, their message. So I realize that you know, this is where I, you know, with birth work and yoga can really just take a hold of, of standing up for what I believe in. And shortly after I became a doula, uh, which is the birth working title I, I have, I was, we were all hit with the pandemic, and man, <laughs> um, I quit my job in March of last year, I think almost to the day um, this week, and I thought that I would be doing that full time, and never in my life, I know none of us, we're all in the same boat, nobody would have ever thought that the pandemic would have happened or hit us as hard as it did with so much uncertainty. So I quit the nonprofit that I was working at, and it was an arts organization, so I had a, a lot of connections in the community already just because of growing up around here, and um, working in coffee shops really does give you a lot more connections than I think people realize. <laughs> so I'm always grateful for all those jobs, even when I hated them. Uh, so uh, I was trying to figure out like what I can do uh, now. All my jobs were lost. I have no idea what the future holds. I have no income, I'm quitting my job and my, you know, my bank account is negative and I have, I'm in fear. But with that fear felt like I had to figure out, I had to pivot like so many other people and figure out what that looked like. What did the, what did the future that I had no idea, what did it look like? So I started doing my little side businesses. I, I knit and I dog sit and I, I, I do yoga on Zoom and you know, it felt like it was gonna be okay for a little bit. And then all of the riots started happening. And I'll go back to those slides in a moment. So over the spring, um, the killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd activated this area in a way that I had never seen before. And for someone who has felt so enraged at times and felt so isolated and so alone, and like people didn't listen to my voice, people were starting to listen. And the protests started happening and the rallies and they were so beautiful to see so many different people from all different walks of life come together and to be in support of black lives and really like bringing back from, I believe it was started in 2014, um, the BLM movement in general. So bringing back the BLM movement and not just letting it be in a moment, but letting it really like take over and to hear our voices and to be able to advocate and to be able to collaborate and to be able to do things just like this where our voices are being recognized and amplified and people are listening and, and wanting to take action. So this a few shots from the protest, the black lives, the matter is cut off, but that was painted on Lark Street uh, in the middle of the summer, which was really beautiful. Uh, the organization Inner Own Voices had that painted with the city. And the top picture that you see on the right side is from the first march that was in Albany and that was organized by Kleana and Amy Jones. And they are two pioneers in this area that have been so big in the activism movement, have been doing it for so long. And they, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It was a mile long of people just standing together and being able to believe in something and to have so much outrage and want to work together in a way that will bring social change. And then the bottom picture on the right is a picture from another protest. Uh, it was a peaceful rally, but it didn't turn out so great at the end, but nobody was hurt and it was beautiful to be able to again stand with people who I know are in the community that support us and are, are right by my side and right by our sides. So thank you to everybody that was there, if anybody, and if any of you are listening. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'll, I'll go back. So one of the things that I think was a part of 
myself and doing this work was, okay, I see a need. I see that there are many different holes that are happening within the government and because of the pandemic and how, how hard it hit specifically marginalized communities, what can I do? What is it that I can do other than go to a rally, other than go to a protest? Um, I did also do some reparations work raising money and we raised, I think in the, it was about the first week we raised about $30,000 and to date, I've raised over $200,000 that has gone back into the black and brown community and back into businesses, to scholarships, and it's been a really beautiful thing to watch everybody come together to help raise that money and to have small fundraisers for people who are in need without housing. And so this is all sort of coming together in my brain. Okay, now what can I do? What is it that, that the community needs more than money? And it's food. Food is such a hard thing for people to get during a pandemic when they need public assistance. And it could mean that people who have never been on it don't know how to get it, don't know where it comes from. And people are seeing it in, in family members and friends and people who never thought they would need public assistance. But because of income gaps and because of wages and because of kids being at home, uh, everyone's lives obviously got turned upside down and people are like are going without. And so all of these organizations started to come up with different ways to help Feed Albany. Speaking of, Feed Albany is an organization that I also work with to help with this project. So again, thank you, Feed Albany. Uh, and someone had brought to my attention that there was this project going on in other places and they were refrigerators on the street and they were filled with food and it was sort of a give some, take some. And I thought, okay, well, I see that this is happening. Albany is a very specific place. How can I, how can I take this idea and then sort of change it and morph it into something that Albany, that Albany can use and that Albany needs? And so I put the word out uh, and I said, hey, <laughs> I want to do this project. Would anybody be willing to help? And I immediately got a response. I got donations from Lowe's, Lowe's donated refrigerators. And before I even had a place to put the refrigerators, I had everything I needed. So then it was about going out and sort of scouting. How can I scout spots? How can I explain to people who don't necessarily understand what food insecurity is to people to say, hey, listen, you're in a neighborhood and there are no grocery stores, they're experiencing a food apartheid, there is only bodegas, there's only corner stores, and they're doing a lot, and they're, but they're not able to meet the, the need as high as it is and as fast as it's grown. So I scouted out a bunch of locations and of course I got a lot of no's because it hadn't happened here yet, so people were not sure what it would look like or how it would happen, and I finally got the first yes. And that moment was, I, I was like, okay, people want this, people get it, they understand. If you've ever faced food insecurity, if you've ever gone without a meal, if, you know, there's stories of people all over the place that are letting their kids eat, but they're not going to sleep fed. And it's people right in our neighborhoods. It's, it's not in these places that you don't see. It's like we drive through those neighborhoods and we see those people. We are those people. I am that person. I have been that person. And the system is designed to to be a way of redlining. So if you don't have the, the language, if you don't have the know-how, if you don't have the transportation, all of these things that the government provides are not being provided to us. And we as community members, as people who understand what it feels like to go without, we need to step up. So when the first place said yes, which was at the free school, thank you, Deirdre, um, Deirdre said yes, and Deirdre's yes was the biggest yes I've ever gotten. It was a yes that changed my life, and it changed so many other people's lives. I'm like getting emotional. Um, so I am really grateful because I was taking a huge risk on myself and taking a huge risk with the community, and I got so many questions, so many questions that were... <laughs> um, were 
were real. People had real questions about what happens to the food. Well, you know, what if, what if, what if? And I promise every what if that I got, I gave myself that 10 times before. So when anybody met me with a negative question, I promised that I'd already been in that space and I have, I have an answer. So we put the fridge out and I'll show a video in a second of that. But I wanted to show this chart here. This is Maslow's theory, and it basically just breaks down what, what it means to be a human, right? And what are the things that we need? And one of the, the, for the second thing on the, like the teal color is safety, safety needs, security and safety. If we are house insecure, if we are food insecure, if we don't have language, if we can't connect, if we don't have our basic needs met, we cannot live, we cannot act, we cannot perform, we can't have the, like our basic needs not being met means that we aren't able to grow, we aren't able to heal. And so food, although people are like, well, everybody eats, but what kind of food are we eating? You know, like are people eating food that is good for their bodies? Is it, is it food that they're eating? Is it, you know, good for their system? What are the allergies? And you shouldn't just have to take what you get. And that's what this project really is about. It's like, we deserve the good stuff. We deserve the good food. We deserve to eat in a way that everybody eats, not just because we don't have any money, but it's a human right. Like to eat food, to eat good food, it is our right. And to provide that to the community and to be able to offer that free of charge and to offer it with complete anonymity is is really huge because again, someone who has experienced food insecurity, there is so much shame that goes around it. So I'll move on. <laughs> so just some statistics and specifically the one at the bottom, 31,000 people in Albany County have experienced food insecurity at some point during the year 2018. And that was pre-pandemic. <laughs> so I, I don't know the current statistic and I'm sure it's astronomical, but again, it's not like it's happening in other places, just in other places or just in other countries. This is happening right in your backyard, like literally in your backyard. And we have to step up when the government isn't. We have to step up when the government isn't capable of doing it. And we need to band together and provide the resources that we deserve. And that's, that's what mutual aid is. Uh, here's a picture from um, one of a, a skate rally up to the right, and then the one of the larger picture uh, that is from the Troy rally, which 11,000 people uh, went to, which was really, really wild. <laughs> 11,000 people in the streets of Troy. <laughs> and then on the right corner, the Black Lives Matter sticker is actually the first collaboration that I did with Mailworks. Um, Bree that owns it, she's amazing she partnered with she was my first collaborator and helped me raise that thirty thousand uh, dollars i think in total it was like 32 or thirty-three thousand dollars from just decals so if you ever see any of those black lives matter decals that's what that's from and here is the first location at the free school um, my friend did a rendering this is like how i do my little peeks of like what will it look like um, so the first picture on the left is the picture of the rendering and then the right is the actual fridge and People are always asking like what do you need? What do you need for the fridge? Like how do we get this going? And I'm like, I just need an outlet like literally just an outlet and we're good to go So Deirdre opened up her window <laughs> as you can see and we put a cord in and um, that was like that moment it was so anticlimactic, but it was <laughs> just plugging it in but it was it was really monumental. Like what was to come, none of, us, none of us knew. And again, I'm just one of the few, pe I'm one of the many people who is doing things like this. So I'm just grateful to be able to share mine, my story. So I'll play, this is a video that my friend Mark O'Brien did um, and music by a friend, his name is Jojo, it goes by nuns. Um, and this is one of my favorite videos because it is the first one, but it is also um, showing all my friends coming together and help put the first fridge out. And so I, it was just like a, a really beautiful moment. So I'll play this for y'all.
All right. So I love seeing that plain white fridge because we just turned we turned it red. <laughs> it, those fridges only look like that for a little bit of time. Um, so it's, it's very funny to see how bright it looked and now it's like got stuff all over it, which the, the Elm Street fridge, if you haven't seen it, uh, is the third the third picture on the slides. And that one was painted by Trash Kit Art, who also, that's a friend of mine, their name is Jade, and Jade also does Amplified Voices, which is a youth-focused program that helps paint murals are all around Albany. So that's a really beautiful project. If you're unfamiliar, definitely look into that. Uh, so this is, this is four of the six fridges that are out right now, and we will have seven. Um, the seventh one will be in front of the Troy Bike Rescue, and um, my idea for the fridges is to be able to paint them in a way that's inviting and to put more than just English on there. I even like to expand to other languages. I know there's a lot of Burmese refugees in Albany and Corinna is the language that they speak and so that's really important that we get that language on the fridges, seeing as how a lot of the fridges are in neighborhoods with, the, um, with them there. And I wanna make sure that like, that they everybody knows that it's for them and it's it's funny when you see people walk by the fridges at first and they just sort of look at it like why is this on the street which is a very good question um, and then I just say it's free food and they're like wait for who I'm like for you it's for us it's for the community they're like so I can just take it and I'm like yeah it's yours and to be able to say that to someone who's houseless who might be living out of their car who might be walking and lives on the street like it's a beautiful thing and, and allows to give agency to people who have to, who feel like they can't just take or they can't just have and the, the stigma associated with that. And so this project is also to help destigmatize other people, which is a really important thing in this work. And it's like the people who live, necess not necessarily in, in a house, but like maybe live in a park next to you. Those are your neighbors. And it's important that we take care of them. And this is a part of that. And so get, collecting the community resources to be able to put food in these fridges is the neighbors and, and, and neighborhood and community helping. Um, the first fridge is on the screen is painted by Yi Mendoza, who owns Yes Folk. Um, I also try to get Latinx and um, indigenous and black people to paint the fridges, although that's not the case for all of the fridges. It is super important going forward and making sure that we're paying them uh, an, a, a wage and then paying them a little more than they ask for. <laughs> the second fridge is by Rachel Baxter. Um, and the third fridge, like I said, was by Trash Kid. And Trash Kid did another fridge, the small fridge, which I don't think there's a slide of that in here, but I think it's on the next one. And then this last one is by Rizza Boogie, who Rizza Boogie is a muralist that came to Albany and worked with Albany Center Gallery to paint the fridge. So they're just, they're fun. My intent for the last fridge is to have kids color it in like a coloring book. And there's a picture of Yi painting the pink fridge and trash good art jade in front of the, the baby fridge, I call it. <laughs> and then I have another video. So um, this video is from BuzzFeed. So it's an offshoot of BuzzFeed called Goodful and they came out, uh, I, think in, I think it was October to do this video. So it just came out, so it looks really sunny and I'm, I can't wait for that to come back. <laughs> People often ask me, but what if someone steals the food? And then my only question is, how can you steal something that's free? The Free Food Fridge Project is a community and mutual aid project to provide free food for folks in marginalized communities. What has been so astonishing to me is how fast people picked up on what was going on and how much coverage it got, and then how much it reached other people that needed it. It's not someone coming and taking a bunch of food at once, it's many people coming up and taking just what they need. And that's been a really beautiful thing to watch because we live in a place of scarcity. Donors have been coming by actually every single day to stock the fridges. It's been a lot of coordination. The fridges emptied every single day. I wanted to start this initiative because I wanted to help with the food apartheid happening in marginalized communities here, specifically in Albany, in the South End, West Hill, and all the other communities around. You can tell the difference in the streets in different neighborhoods where the money is being put into the cities and where it's not. As someone who grew up in a very food insecure home, in a low income home, I wanted to have a resource for folks just like me to be able to be provided with healthy alternatives. We've also worked with a ton of local farms and it's been really amazing to see people just reaching out to us, kind of like, hey, we see what you're doing and we want to help. People are just happy to give. It's been a spreading of the wealth in many different ways, not just monetary donation. It could be 
food, it could be PPE supplies, it could be clothes, it could be anything. For me, this has been about reparations and reparations for the community at large. The food injustice that's happening within our area is out of control. There are not the same resources in the more affluent neighborhoods as there are here. On this block alone, there are two corner stores and a liquor store, and there's nowhere to get fresh food. Because of the influx of resources, I've seen a direct impact in this community, and with myself also, because people are not afraid to ask anymore. There's not as much shame around asking for resources that we need. When someone comes up and they don't see something that they saw last time, they say, hey, where's that thing that was in there? because they really enjoyed it, then we'll make sure we get it back. The fridge is supposed to be reliable for people in this neighborhood. If someone wanted to start one of these fridges, I would say the first place to start is to reach out to independently owned businesses and corner stores, bodegas, and then starting to reach out to places like Lowe's. Lowe's donated our fridge for free. Very grateful for that. Or even just perusing Craigslist and finding a fridge. If it's in a larger city or area, there's gonna be a lot more restaurants and if you just kind of put it in their ear, they'll most likely bite and they'll probably wanna help. It's been really rewarding being here. I come look at the fridge and check on the fridge every day and being able to talk to people that live in the neighborhood and people who don't live in the neighborhood who need the fridge, thank me. I want people to feel that it is their right to have access to healthy and free food. I'd like to see the fridge itself expand into nonprofit. So creating this on a larger scale, creating more of these around the city. If it takes food to learn about inherent bias and racism, then that's the gateway, you know? If we can all find that common ground, then together we can rebuild and we can bring more attention to the places and the people that need it. It's the least we can do as a community. And I want everybody to know that like this is for them and that we are here and in this together. This is my first time working with a clicker and a mouse at the same time. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that video is a real, really good representation of of what the project was like to begin. Um, there was only one fridge at that point, so this project has grown so much more in the past seven months, and I'm, I'm just really grateful um, to be able to share that with y'all. And something that I wanted to touch on as a part of this presentation was um, just some things, some language, and like I said earlier, language is such a huge part of um, forward movement and how we can call each other in in order to make real social change. And some of the things that I've been seeing and that I, uh, that I really resonate with is allyship, allyship versus solidarity. And allyship was something that I feel people have been, have been saying and being an ally and being an ally. And we've seen now in the last few months, in the past year, that allyship can be a little bit more on the performative side. And it's something that we should have conversations around and to talk to people and to educate them on what the difference is. So the main point of allyship for me uh, is, is it's more of a performative thing. You can be an ally, but being an ally could mean that behind closed doors that you're not actually speaking up for people who are marginalized or othered. And so it is almost more important behind closed doors to speak up because this is not just something that we believe in for the time being. This is something that will help us move forward and eradicate racism and abolish racism and it's important that we can make that distinction and with solidarity is someone standing right by your side like person uh, you know a non bipoc person standing with you and not speaking over you or speaking for you but amplifying what you have to say and for me and for the community that's what we need we need solidarity we don't need someone to just be there when the cameras are we need somebody to be there when it's really hard when there's no one else standing by our side and that is how we bring, a, bring change. And that's how we are able to make this not a moment, but a movement, and to continue to do that, and to eradicate racism within all cultures. Um, and obviously, uh, food isn't the only way to do that, but these conversations, and having the hard-hitting conversations, and I, I personally love the idea of food because food is something that we, you know, like we said, it's a basic need, but it's the way that we all can communicate. Everybody needs food. It is like, it's how we build 
how we build intergeneration, like we, like we stop intergenerational trauma, but we build new relationships and we heal ourselves and we heal our communities. It's over the kitchen table, you know, and, and so although we may not be sitting at a kitchen table together right now, we are figuratively sitting at a kitchen table. And so using that time to really understand what it means to be in solidarity. Uh, and then just a few more slides on mutual aid and reparations. Uh, so for me, reparations is a huge part of this project. Um, it is a reparations project, like I said in the video. And this is a way for us, those with not necessarily monetary wealth, but possibly resource. How can you use your resources to spread them throughout the communities that don't need them? For me, I didn't have money. And so for me, using uh, my connection to the community was my form of reparations within my own community. So I was able to reach out to people who I know that want to help, and they helped bring this project to fruition. And then I'm just bridging a gap. So this project is to bridge gaps for people and to, again, not be afraid to just ask. And then the mutual aid aspect. Mutual aid is, I think that I didn't quite understand what mutual aid was until now. Um, and it, it really is just supporting the people around you. We don't, we don't need to, our neighbors don't need to live in scarcity when we live in abundance. So how can we bring it together? How can we not need someone to, I don't need you to give me something in order for me to give you something. I just want to share what I have with you. And at this moment, it can't be a hug, although I'd love to hug everybody. Um, so just thinking about, and, and more of a self-reflection on what is it that I have an abundance of, and how can I bring and give that to uh, people in the community? And just some bits about the Free Food Fridge Project. So we are on Patreon, and um, we, like, we have been, done an amazing job um, fundraising for, for the program. So one of the things that has been really helpful, another way to do mutual aid, not necessarily even for my project, but other projects like it for other artists who have maybe lost their jobs. Um, Patreon is a really beautiful way to you to do mutual aid because it could just be a dollar. Like people have donated just a dollar and we're well past a dollar now and that dollar really does help. A uh, dollar can do a lot for someone. So just thinking, reframing the, the narrative of what money is and what like what it actually means to have wealth and if you just have one extra dollar that you could give it to someone and they need that and that right there is mutual aid and that's a really beautiful thing and then to come completely full circle um i was recently on the cover of time magazine uh, talking about this project and i am one of the four covers uh they're all basically talking about women during the pandemic and things that uh, we have done to step up in order to help and to fight against the status quo. Um, so for me, I'm one of the four covers. This one specifically is the food insecurity one. So it goes a little bit more into the story and that this magazine actually came out this week. So if you're in stores, you might see it. And just a few ways to contact us. Um, if anybody wants to learn how to volunteer, learn more about the project or um, just get involved. Uh, you can email us or you can hit us up on Instagram. And I think I'll answer some questions now. <laughs> Thank you. How can I get involved if I can't afford to donate? I love that. That's exactly what I said. Do you have time? <laughs> if you have time, you can help volunteer. Um, even just resharing a post, that's helping. So. I think it's really beautiful that you want to, and um, I encourage you to reach out to other places doing exactly what I'm doing, um, like the 518 Free Store, or some of the Black Bail Funds, or um, even the South End Children's Cafe. There are a lot of really beautiful organizations right here in Albany and Troy that are helping the community. Are you planning to expand the effort to other areas like Troy? Could this be applied to specifically help college students with food insecurity? Oh, thank you for what you do. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Um, yes, so we are in Troy. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned that or not, uh, but we are in Troy, and right now there's one in front of Collar Works, which is on River Street, so it's a little bit past Hoosick, and we're going to also get one in, heading into Lansingburg in front of the Troy Bike Rescue. My hopes are to get one in um, the south end of Albany, or rather Troy, um, to get one 
into an area that I would like to put out a couple. So if anybody has any leads on that, please feel free to reach out to us. So the answer is yes, we have some in Troy. How can you tell me what, how can you tell when it's best to advocate and carve out a place within an existing space that has glaring issues versus founding your own? Oh, wow, really good question. I always tell people, question your authority, question your leaders, ask them why these things are happening in your job or in the spaces that you're in. And honestly, if someone doesn't want you to work for them or with them because you ask them why their practices are racist, then you probably shouldn't work there. You can come work for me. <laughs> what are your plans for the future of the fridge? So the video, I think, said that a little bit, but. I think I want to mobilize this project. Uh, I know that there are like food trucks that give out food and things in the area already, but I would love to do something similar. Again, my project is not to come in and take over. It's here to amplify the things that are already happening within the area and the already wonderful food programs that exist. It's just another thing for people to take from um, unapologetically. What does redlining mean? So redlining. <sighs> So redlining is a term that was created when um, black, black and brown people, um, when slavery was, was abolished and people started to move into neighborhoods, started to own property and housing and um, the government and banks started to literally draw red lines around certain neighborhoods where they would not give people money um, or they wouldn't give them loans. And it was, a, it was a way to segregate black and brown people from the non-black and brown people. And so the term redlining is something that I've used, I've heard used in terms of other things, so going beyond just like housing. Um, and it's something to definitely take a deep dive in. It's really, really, it's really sad. Um, and it exists to this day. You can look up maps of Albany specifically with red lines all around them. And it's to keep people in and to keep other people out. Do you see a future where the free food fridge is not necessary? <sighs> Man, um, that's a really hard one because I would like to say yes, um, but unless something really big happens and, and you know we all have a livable wage, um, we all have a universal income, I think that food insecurity is unfortunately gonna be running rampant for a while. But with the help of the community and people coming together, we can definitely alleviate some of the, um, the stress of food insecure people and to get them the food that they need and that they deserve. Can you explain what the term of food apartheid? So a food apartheid, sometimes people use, and I think it's even in this slide, but they say food desert and that sort of implies like an oasis of sorts or um, that it just doesn't, it doesn't hit enough. It's not that people are choosing to not have food in, in the areas that they live. They're experiencing a food apartheid. Because of things like redlining, it has now stopped people from having access to um, their necessities, aside from food, also from healthcare. Uh, if you drive downtown in Arbor Hill or you drive down in the South End in Albany specifically, there are no doctors really, there are no grocery stores. Um, and so the whole neighborhood is experiencing a food apartheid as well as many other insecurities. And it's purely based on the way cities are designed, uh, especially when cities are designed on hills. Um, think of kings and queens um, when the, you know, they're up high and then all the, the, the townspeople are down low and they're living in squalor. Like it's, it's the same thing. And so we are just living in a, a day and age where all of these systemic, systemic oppressions that were created way back long ago are now so inherent and so embedded within our government and so inherent within our local governments and the way that education and, and beyond, um, it's all here still. It just looks a little different. So on that note, thank you everybody. Um, Please feel free to reach out. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you again for, for having me, and I hope to meet you all. Oh, one more question. A few more. Okay. Just kidding. <laughs> I'll take back my goodbyes. How can I take a yoga class with you? <laughs> um, so you can follow me on Instagram, on my personal Instagram. It's at Jamella, J-A-M-M-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. And... Um, I do it online right now, and I know that we'll be moving into the park. It seems like today would be a day you could do it in the park, but it's still too cold. Uh, so I do it, yeah, mostly online, and I do privates and things. 
<laughs> Thanks for asking. I forget that I teach yoga sometimes because the fridge project is like my baby. <laughs> it's the thing I do every day, mostly. <laughs> Thank you. Would you class inaccessibility to healthy food environmental racism? 100%. 100%. Yeah, to live in areas where there are farm plots, there are gardens, and we don't have any connection. Like we, we, you know, and that's not to say everybody. There are beautiful places and so many black and brown farmers in this area that go above and beyond to help educate, but environmental racism is, it, it really is a problem. And I, I think it's, it's something that is not, could be a whole other presentation, to be completely honest. But yes, I do agree that it is an accessibility to food is a part of environmental racism. Also, check out Soul Fire Farm if you want to learn some educational things about farming in the area from ind Black and Indigenous people. One more. <laughs> Thank you. How do you find choose artists? I put calls out online. Um, artists to paint the fridges. I put calls out online. Uh, a lot of people I would already been talking to for years. Um, not years, I mean months. It feels like this past year has been years. And uh, I talked to them originally about um, painting the fridges. So I have a couple people in mind that I'm gonna have do the fridges going forward. But if you have a fridge design, I would love it if you wanted to potentially be a fridge painter, you can make up the design and then send it to me through our email at Free Food Fridge Albany, um, just so that we're not inundated with messages on Instagram so I can actually see it and like give it, give it some more attention. One more. <laughs> I was so nervous. Now I'm not nervous anymore. I could be up here forever. That can't, that say it one more time. Pay meaningfully. How can I create like Jamela? How can we create more jobs that pay, basically pay better wages? <sighs> um, I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> I will say that I think that having a system, I think rather I know nonprofits are really beautiful and they do a lot. I think that it is unfair to hold money for only nonprofits. I feel like everybody, no matter whether they're not nonprofit or not, should have access to the abundance of money that is available to nonprofits, and they should go to organizations like my own. I will become a nonprofit eventually, but it's not my main goal in this moment. And so for me, fundraising has been the way that I can pay people. And that's not to say that everybody has the same connections that I do, or someone might have more connections. Um, and so for me, I've had to create my own job. I created this, you know, I created this for myself because I was never getting paid enough. And I, I think it's important that you, if you are able to, to create your own thing, to try it and just give yourself a chance and to ask for money that you need. And if you're the person commissioning people, pay them more than they ask for. If you're the person who is offering the job, like people are well worth more than, than, they, than starting rates. And our minimum wage, I was looking at a graph the other day, I think it's been 725 for the past 12 years or something, Maybe, I'm sure it's been longer. I couldn't go to a job right now and make 725 and live. Like there would be, I would be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have anywhere to live. And and it's it's really sad. So I think the whole system just needs a rewiring. <laughs> so I have no answer. <laughs> I have a lot of different answers. <laughs> That's it. All right. Well, thank you everybody. Um, I appreciate the time that you took to watch this, and thank you Hudson Valley and Anne for having me. Have a good one, everyone. <laughs>